How good is Eli? Peter, give him a round of applause. <laughs> I think it brings to life um, part of this Easter story with a bit of bogan. That's nice. <laughs> you know, I've been praying as we're preparing for Easter. Um, we were looking for a guest, but you got stuck with me. Um, but I was praying that God would reveal more of his truth that we have often overlooked or not seen. And I was thinking, I hope that's you know, good for you know, the church and the people. But you know what? God has really blessed me and unraveled some new parts of the Easter story that I have overlooked. And my prayer is that today there would be something new afresh that God would remind and encourage you about the beauty and wonder of this Easter story. Um, Lauren says a good teacher will always tell you what you're going to teach them and then you're going to tell them and then you tell them what you just told them and today she's helping me um, uh, I'm going to tell you what we're going to be doing today talking about there's going to be three parts of this this talk this message the first part is the significance and importance of the resurrection the second part will be three important reminders after uh, after the cross and the third part will be how Jesus continually reminds us that we are complete with him. So we're going to go through that sort of like the way through that I'm going to go through this message. Now I want to remind us that salvation, we say the word salvation a lot. But salvation means saved by God from the consequence of sin. Saved by God from the consequence of sin. We're saved by God from the consequence of sin, of wrongdoing. And that through that gift, we will one day get to spend eternity with him. But for now, we're here living that truth out today. The thing is, Jesus' resurrection makes way for our salvation. Jesus' resurrection makes way for your salvation. Without the resurrection, the cross is useless. Often, the, for the first 500 years or so, the, the church didn't really value the cross because they saw it as death. They valued the resurrection. And we see poor people walking around with crosses. We, well, man, we should be walking around with empty tombs. I don't know how you'd tattoo that on your chest or anything like that, but good luck. But the Jesus resurrection makes a way for our salvation. In John 14, 13, it says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven Given unto men by which we must be saved. Amen? Amen. Jesus was beaten, mocked, abused, accused of being a blasphemer, and died a criminal's death. But God raised him from the dead. Amen? Vindicating from and thereby improving his innocence. The resurrection proved that Jesus was telling the truth. Because God could not have accepted or resurrected a phony or a liar or a sinner. Jesus was who he said he was. He was the Son of God, the Messiah, the way, the truth, and the life. The resurrection proves that, that belief in Jesus is grounded in truth. It is not foolish. And for 40 days, Jesus appeared to over 500 people. And the disciples were blessed to see him in the flesh three times. The resurrection proved that Jesus had the authority to forgive sins and showed that God not only accepted Jesus' sacrifice and payment for sin, but he declared Jesus victorious, amen, by raising him from the dead. And now he is seated at the right hand of God the Father. The resurrection of Jesus has changed everything for the better. He has made a way for us and our eternity. And I love that John 10.10, 10, the thief came to steal, kill and destroy the thief came to steal, kill, and destroy. And we see that at the cross. But Jesus came that we may have life and to have it in all its fullness. And the, the, resurrection, the resurrection allows us to live in that fullness. You'll see the colors displayed over the cross today. When we live in the fullness of God, we live in full color. Have you ever looked at TVs probably 20 years ago compared to TVs now? Bit, bit the color, the crystal, crystal clear of this, of this screen, watching sport on a TV 20 years ago compared to now. It's like, it's like being there. And that is what it, 
what it's like when we live in the fullness and knowledge and understanding of who Jesus is and what the resurrection means. We get to live life in full HD. Jesus' resurrection makes a way for your salvation. In the second part, these three important reminders at the cross I want to just bring to you. Humility is always needed when it comes to our faith. Humility is always needed when it comes to our faith. See, Jesus' Jesus' burial was unusual. Jesus' burial was very unusual. Most crucified people, majority of crucified people, did not have a, a burial. They were dumped on a rubbish dump and wild dogs and hyenas would eat them. The fact that Jesus was buried after death was a big deal. It was a very big deal. Because it had to happen to fulfill scripture. But the humility needed for Joseph, or Arimathea, I think I said that right for the scholars, I probably got it wrong. But Joseph had to act fast. And this was the same man that was in the, the house, part of the Sanhedrin group, that said, yep, crucify him. Joseph, after the resurrection, after dying on the cross, he had to go and ask Pilate for his body. Can you imagine the humility? He got it wrong. He realized. And then he had to go and ask for the body to bury him. Humility is always needed. The second thing is, it's never too late or early to turn to Jesus and repent. And this is a truth that I've overlooked. The men who buried Jesus belonged to the group that condemned him. The men who buried Jesus, think about that. The men who buried Jesus belonged to the group that condemned him. The Bible tells us that Nicodemus, a Pharisee, and Joseph, a Sadducee, quickly went to Pilate and asked him, Can we bury Jesus? And they wanted to do it because the Sabbath was coming and you couldn't do anything on the Sabbath. But you know what these religious, rich, and quite, let's just say, corrupt men did? They fulfilled the prophecy that was spoken about in Isaiah 53, 9. It says, he he was assigned a grave, talking about Jesus, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. See, what had happened, Joseph gave up his tomb. This rich, not Pharisee, Sadducee, this rich Sadducee gave up his tomb, gave up his grave, carved in complete stone. And only wealthy people could have a grave like that. It is never too late or too early to turn to Jesus and repent. And these two men were there. They were there when they convicted Jesus, even though they know that they knew the truth. And you know what? They let the fear of man conquer them then. But now they realize who Jesus was. And they went, pleaded with Pilate, and they buried him. And in so doing, Fulfilled scripture. It is amazing the amount of prophecies get fulfilled at the Easter time. You could not orchestrate this. You couldn't make this up. You couldn't have all of these written down and make, okay, we're going to do this. Make sure. It just happened. The second thing is this, and this is absolutely astounding to me, is God's timing is perfect, but God's timing is beautiful. God's timing is perfect and is beautiful. The timing of the cross, the timing of the cross and the resurrection was significant. During the festival, the Passover lambs were sacrificed on the 14th day of the month. Okay, So in Old Testament times, a way of paying for people's wrongdoing was to get an unblemished animal, in this particular case a lamb, and they would kill it. And spill spill the blood. And that was a sign of forgiving the people for their sins. And at the same time, lambs were being sacrificed. It was the same time that Jesus hung on a cross. 
the Lamb of God. When we talk about the Lamb of God, we're talking about the unblemished Lamb of God who hung on a cross to pay for the sins once and for all. But if you think that's amazing, go a little bit further. After the 14th of the month, two days later, the Jews celebrated the Feast of First Fruits. Anyone ever heard of that? My daughter must have heard me practicing my message at home, and she comes up with some earrings, and she says, Dad, because it's the day of the first fruits, and I'm thinking, where is she getting this with? And she wanted to wear fruit earrings. If you look at my daughter's earrings, she's got, like, I think, strawberry earrings or something fruit. Anyway, a bit of trivia. Um, celebrated the, the Feast of First Fruits, and the First Fruits was an offering of the first agriculture produce or harvest. And it happened a couple of days after the Passover lambs of sacrifice. And we've got to remember this. A new day begins in the, in the Jewish calendar. A new day begins when the sun sets, not when it rises. So when Jesus was right, right when Jesus came back to life and he was raised from the dead, it was the day of the first fruits. Jesus was risen on the day of the first fruits. And you're thinking, oh, so what? But it's a signal of new life a new provision, and a reminder of this new hope that we have in him. There are so many ways in the Easter story that God wants to tell us over and over and over again, drawing, drawing us to him. He just wants to just do it. And he did it so many different ways. And the deeper we delve in the scriptures, the more we unpack and discover that he went to absolute extreme lengths so that there would not be a shadow of a doubt that he loves you and he's bringing you to him. And I'll tell you, this particular thing that I'm going to share with you now has been the biggest revelation for me, um, well, particularly in the Easter story, for a long, long time. And it's part three, how, does, how Jesus continually reminds us that we are complete, complete in him. Because Jesus' death on the cross, because of Jesus' death on the cross, we can be complete with him. And the work was God's and the choice is ours. Often when I've read scripture, I've overlooked the importance of numbers. But in Hebrew, numbers are quite significant. Numbers are very important, particular the number three. The number three is very important. The number three means complete. It means good. And the number three is used in Scripture 460 odd times. Good luck looking it up. I had to Google that one. Um, 467 times, and that's what some scholars would say. It means complete and good. And sometimes... And you would know, for instance, if you've ever disciplined your child, what have you got to get to before they actually do what you want? One, two, three. Okay. When we say, holy is the Lord God Almighty, we want to, you know, we want to reinforce it. We say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. There's something powerful about three. You're thinking, oh, Mark, it's a bit of a stretch. How many times did God call Samuel? Three times. When Jesus was born in a manger, how many wise men came? Three. How many gifts were given? Three. How many times did Jesus pray in the Garden of Gethsemane? Three. When Jesus was placed on the cross on the third hour of the day, and when Jesus died on the cross on the ninth hour of the day, which is 3 p.m., and then after that, darkness covered the whole land. For how long? Three hours. Interesting. And Jesus died and rose again on the third day. And we'll get to it in a second, but we also remember three represents the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Complete. And we cannot get to the story of Peter without understanding the importance of three. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. He didn't just deny him a little bit. He didn't just deny him a little bit. He denied him. He said, oh, no, I don't know. I don't know Jesus. I mean, I don't know Jesus. I'm telling you, I don't know him. And then he calls down curses. He says, I don't know him. It was complete. He had absolutely denied 
Jesus. And then how many times did Jesus appear to Peter before he went back to heaven after the resurrection? How many times? Three. We see it in Scripture. In John 21, 14. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples and after he was raised from the dead. And then we read, um, that Josh read out to us today, um, Jesus reinstates Peter. And he reinstates it by asking him a question, do you love me? And how many times has he asked the question? He was bringing the restoration. He was reinstating Peter and he wanted to make it complete. He didn't just say, Peter, do you love me? And he left it like that. He asked him again and he asked him for the third time. And what he was saying to Peter and what he was saying to you and I is this. We can now be complete and whole with the risen Jesus. You and I can now be complete and whole with the risen Jesus. And the gift of the Holy Spirit, God with us, absolutely makes it possible. Jesus continually reminds us that we are complete with him. Do you ever sometimes, when, when you, you sense God prompting you, something, you sense God's prompting you, you normally don't do it the first time, do you? Do you? You wait, you wait again for him to prompt you again. Kim shared a little while ago, prompting to go and pray with this guy in the car park. And it was like the third time that he just sort of prompted you and you go, like, okay, let's do it. God understands. He's patient with you. But today, he wants to remind you that you are complete with the risen Savior when you embrace the Holy Spirit in your life. And after the resurrection, something changed in the disciples. They were not fearful men anymore. They didn't just play it safe. They were bold, courageous, passionate to share the good news of Jesus And may it be the same in us. May we not be just quiet. May we live a life that makes people thirsty for the things of God. The interesting thing about what changed these men, they saw Jesus in the flesh after the resurrection three times. It wasn't the first time they probably think, oh, maybe it was a dream, you know. Oh, maybe it was a dream. Second time, oh, yeah, I'm not so sure. But three times, you could not tell the disciples that it wasn't true. So much so, we see that God's disciples were stoned to death, some crucified, and absolutely were destroyed because they wouldn't denounce their faith because they had seen the risen Lord. And the challenge for you and I is this. We don't have the risen Lord in the flesh anymore. The disciples did. But you and I have the Holy Spirit. You and I have God in us. God in us. And Jesus says this. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. He says this to the disciples. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come for you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And the Holy Spirit cements the package. The Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit complete us while we're here on earth. And when we get to heaven, we will be fully restored. But right now, we are complete. We have everything we need to live a colorful life for Him. In a little while... um. We're going to have an opportunity to respond. I think at Easter, we want people to have an opportunity to respond to the greatest love story that's ever been told. And we're going to have an opportunity for you to kneel at the cross, thanking God for his spirit, thanking him for sending his son, thanking him for raising Jesus to life. We're going to have an opportunity. There's going to be, I think, four of us down the front to anoint people in oil as a sign that you are today complete with the Holy Spirit, complete what what. Complete because of what Jesus has done. And there's nothing flashy or magic about it. It's an inward sign that you 
are saying, I want more of your, your spirit in my life. I want to, a photo is going to come up um, on the screen here. Look at these two champions. We've got Lockie over here. He caught 20, is it salmon? Salmon, Taylor. He got 20 fish when he went on holidays, this guy. He's uh, a Rex Hunt. And then there's Emerson over there. And we, uh, we had a, we just went to fish just because we wanted to fish and then we ended up catching fish, which I was amazed about. And we caught like 12 or 13 fish in one sitting. It was crazy. But I want to put your, put your hand up if you like fishing. Okay. Oh, there's a handful of people here. That's great. If you like fishing. How do you know when you've caught a fish? How do you know when you've caught a fish? Something's tugging on the line? Yep. Yeah. What else? But you can't see the fish? You can feel it. You can feel the tug of the pull on the line. You know, um, when Emerson, uh, anyone who's taking kids fishing, we say, um, I'm throwing the line out. Do not reel it in. Don't you know, you say that. Don't reel it in. And I had literally just baited a line. I'd thrown it out and I'm baiting the other line. And she said, Dad, Dad, I've got something. I said, you don't have anything. She, and she started, I said, you don't have anything. She goes, no, I do. I said, you don't. Don't reel it in. And then, then, then all of a sudden she starts getting pulled to, you know, to, to like this. And she goes, no, no, I've got something. And then I'm like, oh, maybe she does. And then, <laughs> and so I go over and I say, okay, reel it in, reel it in, reel it in. And she reels in fish after fish after fish. We, I just kept throwing them in and they kept biting or whatever. And I, we were just using one rod between us. And I was thinking about it. I said, Emerson, how did you know? How did you know you, were, you, you had a fish? You couldn't see it. She goes, I could feel it, Dad. I could feel it pull. I could feel it tug. I could feel my rod bending forward. And that is with the Holy Spirit, my friends. You may not know. You know, I cannot see God. I can't see the Holy Spirit. But you just know. We are, we are spiritual beings, whether you believe it or not. There's a peace in your heart. There's a peace in your soul. There's a peace in your gut, in your mind that only the Holy Spirit can fill. Only God can fill. You were created in the image of God. And there's a peace in your heart and your mind and your spirit that only, only the Holy Spirit can fill. And we've got people who have got everything, but they've got nothing because they don't have Jesus. We've got people that uh, 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 got all the world's wealth and are still longing and looking for something that the world will never give them. But the Holy Spirit, God in us, completes you and I. And it is the greatest gift given to man. That Jesus made a way that His Spirit may live in you and I. That He may live in me. And I know that. People would tell me, Mark, God's not real. People could say this, but you know, I just know. I've had so, I, I just couldn't deny, I couldn't deny it. I just know that God is real. I know the Holy Spirit, God lives in me. And sometimes when, you, when you're fishing, sometimes the pools, the fish may be stronger and smaller. And that's not about God. That's about sometimes in life, the pools of God, the nudge in your spirit, the nudge in your heart can sometimes be quiet. And then sometimes God can just speak and you go, whoa. God, that is just amazing. And you can be overwhelmed with the presence of God. It's like, oh man, I've got a big fish. This is amazing. And today, we're going to respond. And we're going to have an opportunity for you to respond. To be anointed with oil as a sign for you that you are willing to lay your life down and allow the Holy Spirit to take over your life. Maybe for the first time or maybe again. We're going to have an opportunity. We're not going to waste the opportunity. You may want to just come and kneel and just thank God for the gift. As a kneel, humility. A bit like Nicodemus going and asking, humbled himself. He says, I know who he is. So we're just going to have a time for the Holy Spirit, God in you, those tuggings of your heart. Right now, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, Oh, I know there's more to life than this. That is the Holy Spirit, my friend. Anything that draws you to Him, that is the Holy Spirit. And God has more color, more love, more patience, more grace, more favor for you. 
He has a greater life in store for you than you can even comprehend. And yes, you will have to do some tough stuff. But you know what? He's going to be with you. And you will have everything you need in Him. So right now, I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads. And at your choosing, at your choosing, no one can cause you to do anything you don't want to do. At your choosing, I want you to come forward and you may want to kneel at the cross. Just in thanks to the greatest gift. And then you may want to come and be anointed with oil. As a sign that you're surrendering to the Holy Spirit. And that you want Him to have your way in your life.